Angular momentum conservation, you've all seen. What time do I have to free you? Uh, here's an example called the three dumbbell experiment. You have a professor and two dumbbells. And he's spinning. And as he pulls, his, the angular momentum is proportional to r, the distance of his length of his arms, uh, times his angular frequency. And, and as he pulls his arms in, the uh, angular momentum has to be conserved. So r gets smaller, and therefore his angular frequency speeds up. And he, uh, well, actually, it's r cross p. So I take it back. It's proportional to r squared. The, the angular momentum is proportional to r squared. He pulls his arms in a little, and it speeds up a lot. Uh, this history of this is remarkable because people, of course, thought the Earth was at the center and everything went around and everything was a perfect circle and, and uh, Aristotle said so. And Ptolemy developed this into a theory. It was the string theory of its era. And, uh, and it lasted longer than any physics theory I know. Because and it's, it, you can make your theory last if you burn people at the stake and <laughs> argue with you. The string theorists are trying to do that, but they haven't succeeded. Uh, so, anyway, Copernicus was uh, the first person to straighten this out in modern times, but actually there were ancient Greek philosophers who said, no, the sun is at the center. There was one, I think, uh, I forget his name, it, was, it wasn't Aristarchus, it was somebody like that, who, and Hipparchus, who came later, who, who had the whole solar system figured out correctly. They had the moon going around the Earth, they had the Earth going around the sun, and Venus and Mercury closer to the sun, and they had Mars and Jupiter further out. I don't know, and some Saturn too. I think they knew about Saturn. <laughs> well, it was, it was an amazing thing because when Copernicus came up with this, he didn't give up on circles. His orbits were still circles. And if you tried to make predictions with Copernicus's theory, you got all wrong answers. See, Ptolemy had had put circles on circles. He had like a, one of these Glockenspiels. The planets were going around in perfect circles, but, but the circle itself, the planet was on a circle that was spinning around some center on the cir perfect circle. And there was another circle spinning around on that. And the planet was out there like in a cuckoo clock with this thing's going around on that, but it's also going around on a It was a you know, complex cuckoo clock. But he had so fine-tuned it, and actually the Byzantine scholars in the Middle Ages had worked on this obsessively. And they had a perfectly fine-tuned Ptolemaic theory of the world, in which the sun was, uh, the Earth was at the center, and everything went around it. And their predictions for planting crops or navigation of where planets would be were quite accurate. They invented something they didn't realize that they invented something we call Fourier analysis. A friend of mine wrote a book about that. It's very nice. How they didn't, how you can always, with enough epicycles, you can make almost any mathematical function fit. And that's what they did. When Copernicus came along with his circular orbits, it didn't work at all. He got garbage predictions. So, but the, the people who were really thinkers said, well, this is much more sensible. It explains, for example, the phases of Venus. You can start looking through telescopes. And you can see that Venus, like the moon, had crescent phases and gibbous phases. And it told you that Venus was closer to the sun than we were, and that therefore couldn't be going around us. It was always closer to the sun. And so, there, you know, this made a lot of sense, but the circular orbits didn't work. So Kepler got into this, and he was a very mystical kind of guy, and he thought, if I can figure this out, I will understand what God has in there. And he thought he would have this beautiful geometrical picture of orbits that were somehow nested on perfectly in, in, in enclosable geometrical objects, and he figured it all out. And he didn't figure it out that way, but he got it right. This, by the way, Eric, is a perfect example of the importance of doing astronomy. Because this, this was the, what led it, this is the most important discovery in human history, I believe, because it led us to the principle of the nation. It came straight out of astronomy. Uh, we, have a little, we have a little debate going on. What Kepler discovered by focusing first on the orbit of Mars is that it is an ellipse. It's not a circle. So he had to give up one of the basic tenets that Aristotle had been claiming. That the sun is on a focus of the ellipse. And he, he got this law called the equal area law. The area swept out in a certain amount of time here 
is the same as the area swept up the same amount of time here. That turns out to be the law of conservation of angular momentum. And he got a uh, result that the time squared to go around the sun was proportional to like the semi-major axis of the ellipse cubed. And that's all he got. He was very depressed for getting this. Uh, he didn't know why it worked this way. It wasn't what he was seeking. But he is absolutely one of the most honest, greatest scientists who ever lived because he was able to get rid of all of his preconceptions, all of his mysticism that was infecting his thinking, and end up with those three laws. And what also amazes me is he didn't end up with a fourth law that, that was wrong. He got the maximal number of laws you could get. He didn't get anything wrong. He didn't answer what pushes the planets. You see, Aristotle would have insisted something has to push a planet. Because after all, Aristotle lived in an era where if you pushed a cart to move some olive oranges around, if you stopped pushing, the cart stopped. He had to grunt and groan to make things move. So, so obviously something was pushing the planets. And Kepler didn't know the, Kepler thought there was some vortex coming out of the sun or somehow sweeping the planets around and so forth. But this set the stage for Galileo, who said nothing's pushing the planets. Anything that is not acted upon by a force will move by itself or stay at rest. It's the force that causes some, an Oliver and Court car to stop. If there was no force, no friction, the car would keep moving. And that means that it's not the velocity that's important. It's the acceleration. But Galileo didn't really understand acceleration very well. And it took Isaac Newton to put this together. And what Newton did is he postulated a force between the planet and the star it's proportional to the product of the masses and one over the distance squared. And this is one of the greatest Eurekas I can possibly imagine ever happened. He said the force is the mass times acceleration, not velocity. Velocity you get for free. That's inertia. It's force changes velocity, and that's acceleration. And that's the force law. And the force that the Earth is feeling from the Sun is the same as the force the Sun is feeling from the Earth. That's momentum conservation, it turns out. And so what, what Newton did is he had to figure out how planets move in their orbits. And he had to invent a new mathematics to do that, so he invented calculus. And he solved what is one hell of a tough problem, the problem of two-body problem, the motion of a planet going around a central inverse relative force. That's a tough thing. It takes a little while for anybody, any trained scientist, to come and solve that problem. Even we, we've been taught what Newton had to invent. It took Newton 20 years. And one day he discovered the motion is in the universe. He discovered the equal area law, and he discovered the squared proportional to r cubed. All the things that Kepler had distilled down, a list of three things, came out of this. That must have been a really good day. Okay, so that's such an important thing because it led to this principle of inertia, which is really the, this business of, of, of motion. Um, 